Good afternoon, neighbor. I hope you're doing well today. The changing of the seasons give you and I constant opportunities to reflect on the reality that you and I are also constantly changing. I've changed since the previous program. So are you. And before this day is over, we're going to have changed in some ways. And I hope as we study today, these words of truth and reason will contribute to that in the way that you need most. My name is David Halbrook. I'm an evangelist among the Chena Small Tracks Church of Christ in Fairbanks. And we offer these words to you each Tuesday and Thursday at 3.30 p.m. Thank you for sharing a portion of your day with me. Though it's possible that Jesus was asked it more often, we can read two occasions where Jesus was asked, What must I do to inherit eternal life? A lawyer and a rich young ruler asked him this question. We studied those recently. The next time that I can find this question being asked is on the day of Pentecost. Luke records this for us in Acts chapter 2. If you have a Bible, turn to Acts chapter 2 and study with me as we continue in this brief series of studies regarding the question, What shall I do to be saved? Now, an important part of the context of Acts chapter 2 that makes it different from the time that Jesus was asked that question by the lawyer and the ruler is that by the time of Acts chapter 2, Jesus had fulfilled His work on earth. He lived a sinless life. He was crucified and arose from the dead, returned to heaven, and prepared His apostles to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. But before they were to go, in Acts chapter 1, we find that they were told to wait. To wait in Jerusalem, because Jesus was going to send the Holy Spirit to guide and aid them in the work that they had to do. So, as we begin Acts chapter 2, the apostles are doing as they were told. Waiting in Jerusalem for the Holy Spirit. They knew He was coming, but they did not know when. You ever faced occasions in life like that? You knew something was coming, but you didn't know when. That, that can be a test of faith. Well, it was around 10 days after Jesus ascended in the clouds that the 12 apostles were together. And beginning in verse 2 of Acts 2, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, And one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. This is what Jesus promised. The waiting was now over, and the apostles' work was now to begin at Jerusalem. The the sound as of a wind and the appearance as of fire, of course, grabbed the attention of all who were around. And the people who were there on that day were in Jerusalem, but they were not all inhabitants of Jerusalem. You see, it had been a little bit over a month since Passover, the occasion in which Jesus was crucified. And so these people had returned to Jerusalem. Well, now that the apostles had their attention, they preached the gospel, speaking the language of the people who were present. And in the Bible, sometimes that's called speaking in tongues. A tongue is a language It's not indiscernible chatter that's claimed by some people today. In fact, you can read verses 5 through 12. The apostles were speaking the languages of the people who were present. And then beginning in verse 14, we have a partial transcript of Peter's lesson on that day. And in verses 14 to 21, he offered to convince them that the words of Joel, the prophet Joel, matched the events that they were witnessing right then. In verses 22 to 24, Peter rebuked them for crucifying Jesus despite the miracles, signs, and wonders that Jesus did, which proved that God was with him. That that was bold, especially considering the fact that just a few weeks ago, Peter fled and then denied knowing Jesus when in the presence of people who were now, some of which were now listening to him. Then in verses 25 to 35, he convinced them that Jesus arose from the dead based upon the prophecy of David and on the eyewitness testimony that he could offer as well as the other apostles. Then in verse 36, in, in one statement, he convinces, rebukes, and exhorts them when he says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. 
He was preaching the word in season and out of season with all long suffering and doctrine, just as he had learned from the master teacher, Jesus Christ. Then in verse 37, we get some insight into those who were listening, and we learn some things that nobody there could see by sight. It says, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. They listened to the things that in the past they had ignored. They understood things that they had not considered. Their willingness to consider their lives and the Word of God and the work of God in Jesus Christ produced some of the worst feelings and knowledge that we call guilt. Being convinced that God made Jesus Lord and Christ, convinced that they had crucified Him and that He arose from the dead, cut their heart. And then their thought was, now what? And inwardly, they had no response. They didn't know what to do, but they knew who to ask. And so they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Here's the question. Here's the question that we've heard from the lawyer and from the ruler. Those two men came to Jesus with this question. These people ask it in response to what they have heard of Jesus, what they've heard about who he is, the risen Lord in Christ, now at the Father's right hand, and they accept it. They've also heard who they are, and they've accepted that as well. They are sinners. If you were asked this question, what would your answer be? What, what shall I do? If someone convinced that Jesus is the risen Lord in Christ and equally convinced that they are guilty of sin, asked you, what what shall I do? What would you say? Or do you remember a time when you were the one asking that question, that you were the sinner, and so you wanted to know what to do? Do you remember what you were told? What does a sinner who believes Jesus is Lord and Christ need to do? Let's see what Peter and the rest of the apostles say, beginning in verse 38. And Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises to you and your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So those who accepted their sin and that Jesus is Lord and Christ were told, to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Before he ascended, Jesus told his apostles that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations. That's Luke 24, verse 47. Well, clearly, the apostles understood Jesus and they were faithful to preach that on this occasion. No one who heard Peter and the apostles preach could think that God would forgive them of their sins if they did not repent before they were willing to repent because Peter said, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. That was an essential part of what he was telling them. Before Jesus ascended, he also told his apostles to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Jesus also told them, He that believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. That's Matthew 28, verse 19, Mark 16, verse 16. Would you agree that that's a pretty good summary of what the apostles taught here in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost? So back to that chapter. In verse 41, the response is consistent with the teaching. Verse 41 Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. I'm reading from the New King James Version. So they asked what to do, and they were glad to hear the answer, that God would forgive their sins if they believed that Jesus is Lord in Christ when they repented of their sins and were baptized. And people who understood Peter's message would not wait for a more convenient time I mean, when is a more, con- more important time than right now to be forgiven of sin by the death, by the mercy of Jesus Christ? 
And so notice, that day, around 3,000 people were baptized. Why were they all baptized that day? Because they all wanted God to forgive their sins that day. Why wait? So to summarize, people who believed that Jesus is Lord in Christ were told to repent and be baptized for the remission of their sins. Peter also spoke of the gift of the Holy Spirit, God's promise for them and for all people, and additional reasons for them to seek God's help that day. And the people accepted all these things. Now, how does Peter's answer compare to the answer that you would give to sinners today asking that same question? How does that compare, Peter's answer, compared to the answer that you have been given when you recognized your sin and your guilt and you recognized that Jesus is Lord and Christ? I once asked someone, would you say to a sinner like that today what Peter said? Would you tell someone, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins? I had someone tell me, no, I would not say that. Would you say the same words that Peter did? Sadly, the message that Peter gave, the answer he gave, is rarely offered today. Often today, a sinner who believes that Jesus is Lord and who asks, well, what shall I do, is going to be told something like, well, what do you, why are you asking what to do? It's already been done. You believe that Jesus is Lord And he died and arose from the dead, so you're already saved if you believe that. Now, let's go talk to the pastor about scheduling a time for you to be baptized uh, maybe in a week or two, or maybe next Easter when there's a, a mass baptism. Now, please understand, I'm not asking you to compare yourself to me or what I say to what your preacher or pastor says. I'm asking you to compare what I say to what the Scripture says, to what you can read, and to compare what you believe with what the Scripture says, to compare what your preacher or priest says with what the Scripture says. Please understand that's my emphasis. If someone has not repented because they are a baby, for example, do they need to be baptized? Well, that doesn't fit what Peter taught. And of course, they have no sins that need the remission. If someone has sinned but has not believed or has not repented, they don't need to be baptized yet. If someone has sinned and believed and repented, they need to be baptized because Jesus taught that baptism is for the remission of sins. It is His authority. It's not my authority. And it's not based on any church's authority. What I'm teaching today is not baptismal regeneration, but what I'm teaching is the working of God. That's what Paul said in Colossians chapter 2, verse 12. He's reminding these that they had been buried with Him, with Christ, in baptism, in which you were also raised with Him through faith, and notice this, raised with Him through faith in the working of God who raised Him from the dead. So be sure you notice that. Faith doesn't earn us anything. Repentance earns us nothing. Baptism earns us nothing. But if you love Him, keep His command to believe in Him, to repent of sin, to be baptized for the remission of sins. And then God will do the work of removing your sin by the blood of Christ. Just as Jesus said, My blood is shed for the remission of sins. Matthew 26, verse 28. Then we learn when we receive that blood to cleanse us. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, by faith, repenting and being baptized for the remission of sins. I hope you'll think on these things as you ponder the question, what must I do to be saved? We're quickly out of time today, but as you ponder this question and think on this subject and some of the things that I've said and the verses I've read today, As always, if you have questions, I encourage you to to send them or even any comment. You can reach me at chinachurch at gmail.com or through our Facebook page or website, chinachurch.com or call and leave a message at 907-479-6170. At our website, you'll find more information on our meeting times and meeting place. 
And I hope you'll join me again each Tuesday and Thursday at 3.30 p.m. for Words of Truth and Reason.